Well, I'm um, very pleased to present our next speaker. It's also another uh, TED speaker, actually. Um, Nicholas Christakis is a professor of sociology at Harvard University. He's also a professor of medicine and a professor of medical sociology at the Harvard Medical School. Um, uh, Dr. Christakis is a social scientist and physician who conducts research, I'm sure many people already know all his research, on social factors that affect health, health care and longevity. He directs the Human uh, Nature Lab at Harvard University. Um, he's also the co-author of a book, Connected, The Surprising Power of Our Social Networks and How They Shape Our Lives. Some of you may have read it. Um, so he was also elected to the Institute of Medicine and National Academy of Sciences in 2006, and was made a fellow of the American Association of, for the Advancement of Science in 2010. Time Magazine named him to the list of 100 most influential people in the world in 2009. And uh, at Harvard, Chris Dacus teaches medical sociology, quantitative research design, epidemiology, and palliative medicine. And um, it's really a pleasure to have him talk to us today. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for that introduction, and, um, and thank you for having me. So, um, so I'm going to be, sp I've spent the last few years, I'm just going to sort out some of these cables. Uh, I spent the last few years researching human social networks. And in particular, I've been interested in the kind of face-to-face -face networks that human beings make and that we have been making for tens of thousands of years. In fact, some of the work that we've become most recently interested in is addressing the very fundamental question of how and why we humans make networks like this to begin with. What are some of the deep evolutionary origins of the fact that we assemble ourselves into networks? And we don't just assemble ourselves into networks with any old structure. We assemble ourselves into networks with particular topolo topologies, with particular mathematical structures. And what I'm going to be speaking to you about today is some ways we can exploit that, some ways we can take advantage of the fact that networks have particular topologies to actually make the world better by virtue of creating, for instance, a sensor network in the way I'm just going to describe. So I'm going to be talking, as I said, about real social networks, not just the online variety, although I have a few remarks to make about those. And as many of you may know, or some of you may know, my colleague James Fowler and I have been spending the last few years trying to understand how and why we make networks. But recently, we've begun also to tackle the so what question. People ask us, you know, so what? You can understand the kind of social, psychological, mathematical, biological rules of network formation and operation, but what can you do with that knowledge? And so one of the first things we thought we would do is try to apply this knowledge, this better understanding of networks, in order to invent a better way to uh, predict epidemics. And as many of you know nowadays, the state of the art for epidemic uh, understanding the status of epidemics is that there's some central facility, say the CDC or something else, that is located in some central location, and it receives reports from the field about what's happening in the field. So for example, doctors are seeing patients or are administering lab tests. There's some data processing that goes on. These go to the central facility, and two to three weeks from now, if everything goes smoothly, the CDC might know where the epidemic is today. And a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago, of course, there was a publication of Google Flu Trends, which was the idea that by, sur by uh, surveying what people are searching for today, you might have information about the flu epidemic today. But what we were interested in doing is seeing if we could actually invent a way that provided not just early detection, um, not just rapid warning, but early detection. Could we figure out a way that we could forecast the future of the epidemic so that we might know where the epidemic was today? Might we have known that two or three or more weeks ago? Could we have a forecast, not just a rapid understanding of where we stand uh, with respect to the epidemic? And here's a sense in which we thought that a better understanding or knowledge of social networks could provide this ability for us. And it could do this not just for germs, but for all sorts of epidemics, basically for anything that is spreading through interpersonal contact and communication within human social networks. Now, in, uh, it's an obvious statement about social science that people do things in part because others do them. And a host of phenomena are subject to social influence and social contagion, ranging from abstract ideas like on the left, like patriotism and, uh, and altruism, uh, to other sort of more specific instantiations or religion up there, uh, to diets or book purchasing behavior or drinking behavior, or safety practices like wearing uh, bicycle helmets, your friends start wearing a helmet, maybe you start wearing a helmet, uh, to the use of medications, adoption of technology, or almost the canonical network good, which is a fax machine. The first person to adopt a fax machine, that machine is useless to them. But when one other person adopts a fax machine, now it becomes more useful. And actually, the utility of the fax machine, to me, grows exponentially with the number of people that adopt the fax machine. And in fact, as more people adopt, more and more people adopt. 
So you can begin to understand different kinds of processes spreading in networks in exactly this sort of a way. And in fact, as most of you know, probably all of you know, uh, this is the classic sort of s safe diffusion of innovation curve or sort of epidemic growth curve that describes the diffusions of innovations in populations or epidemics in populations. And on the y-axis is the percentage affected. And on the x-axis is time. So at the very beginning, nobody is infected with the germ or affected by the idea or the behavior that we're interested in. Then you sort of have slow adoption, the early adopters or the early people are infected, then you have the epidemic growth phase, and then you reach a plateau as, as you maximize, either you saturate the population, there's no one left to infect, or there's no one left who is willing or interested or capable of adopting whatever it is that might be spreading through the population. Um, and in fact, this grows, uh, and this, this, this type of curve will hold, as I said, for germs, ideas, products, behaviors, uh, and all kinds of phenomena. Now, here is a real network. This is a network of 105 college students and uh, their friendship connections. Every dot's a person. Every line between them represents a relationship between two people. Um, and most social networks, virtually everyone I think that I've ever seen, uh, has this type of a canonical structure. So they all kind of look like this. Is there a laser pointer by any chance that you're aware of? Uh, let's see. Well, anyway, if there's a laser pointer someone can bring me, that'd be great. So. Um, so human social networks, whenever they've been mapped, have this kind of archetypical uh, structure. Uh, but if we look at this network, we can begin to discern that there's heterogeneity in location within the network. So if you look at node B in the upper left, that person has four connections compared to node D, and thank you so much, uh, compared to node D, this is crowdsourcing at its best. Uh, so compared to any other laser pointers, I'll accept all of them. Uh, so, so node B has four friends, and node D has six connections. And if you talk to these individuals, they would be aware of this about themselves, right? This is a property, an egocentric property that someone can know about themselves. But now look at nodes C and D. They both have six connections. And if you talk to them, this might be the limit of their understanding of where they're located within the human social network. But we, with this bird's eye view, can see immediately that there's something different between C and D. And I can cultivate that intuition in you by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network? You'd rather be D. Right? And formally, mathematically, the mean path length between D and every other node is longer than the mean path length between C and every other node. And now, conversely, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? <laughs> You'd rather be C, because again, you have the intuition that C is going to be more likely to get whatever's spreading and is going to be more likely to get it sooner in the course of the epidemic. Finally, if you look at nodes A and B, and incidentally, if, you, if I ask you to cultivate an intuition, who would be more likely to become infected with something, B or D, all else equal, again, you might say D, because D has more connections than B, would be more likely to get it, whatever it is that's moving through the system. Finally, if you look at A and B, uh, A and B both have four direct connections, but there's something different between the two of them. And you can appreciate this by looking at the fact that the friend of a friend of A's is back again a friend of A's, and this is, of course, known as transitivity in a network, whereas the friend of a friend of B's is not a friend of B's. Okay? So uh, one way of understanding this or cultivating this intuition in you is to ask you who do you think would be more likely to be able to get novel information that's flowing through the system, and it would be B, because the friend of a friend of A's is back again a friend of A's, right? It just comes right back to the source, whereas B can reach more distally into the network and get information that's spreading back. And in other work that we've done, we've explored actually the genetic uh, origins and the evolutionary biology of why these types of different locations might confer certain advantages. So if we could somehow find central individuals in a network, first point, and second, if we could also monitor central individuals, we should be better able to identify early things that are spreading within networks, right? Because the central individuals we've already established or just have the intuition are going to get whatever it is that's spreading sooner and are more likely to get it than individuals randomly chosen within the network. So if we have a population like this and we wanted to set up little sentinels or sensors in the network to figure out what was happening, in an ideal world, we would identify central people and sort of monitor, hover over them and monitor them. And if we saw them contract a germ or have a piece of information, uh, we might form the intuition that they're going to be more likely to get it or that soon the rest of the network may be more likely to get it and that these individuals would be identifying and monitoring these individuals would be superior than some kind of random sampling scheme which picks six individuals without reference to the structure of the network in which they were embedded. And in fact, to carry the point and punch it home in a way I suspect some of you are already anticipating, 
we would predict that the epidemic growth curve among the central individuals would be shifted to the left as shown in yellow. So here we have in the dotted red line the population growth curve of the epidemic, but shifted to the left would be in the cumulative, this is the cumulative incidence of the contagion, would be the epidemic among the central individuals. And in fact, if we plotted the daily incidence of the epidemic, the epidemic would peak some amount of time delta T before it peaked in the population as a whole. So if we could monitor central people, identify them, number one, and number two, monitor them, we would be able to get some early warning in advance of the epidemic striking the general population. So this is the theoretical prediction. But mapping a network and discerning all these connections is not always feasible. We'll get to the online world where it may be. And it can be expensive, impractical, unethical, or impossible. So the question now becomes, can we figure out who are the central people without having to map network ties of a whole population, whether of 105 students or 10 million people in an entire nation? And it turns out that there is this mathematical fact about social networks, and here's where we're going to take advantage of some, the fact that we make networks with particular topologies and the fact that we can understand that. Here's where we're going to take advantage of this. It turns out that it's a mathematical fact about social networks that can be summarized in the claim uh, known as the friendship paradox, which is that your friends have more friends than you do. I actually don't know why it's called the friendship paradox. It could equally be called the sexual paradox because your sexual partners have more sexual partners than you do as well. But I don't people want to think about that. So, uh, so your friends have more friends than you do is just a mathematical fact about social networks, and I'll explain to you in a moment uh, why that might be. But you can cultivate that intuition at first by looking at the edge cases. So imagine by dumb luck I'm picking people in a population and I happen to pick people at the edge of the network, as I must do on ch by chance at some occasions. These individuals, by construction, can only have one friend. See, they all have one friend. That's how they come there on the edge. But by definition, the friend that they can nominate, it's the only friend they have to nominate, has to have at least two friends. Otherwise, they'd also be on the edge, but typically more friends. So you should be able to form the intuition that at least for all the individuals on the edge case, they, their friends will have more friends than they do. And it turns out that this holds all the way through the network. Whenever you pick someone at random, on average, the friend that they nominate will have more friends than they do. And I can cultivate, and then formally, mathematically, it's because the random individual in a population has mu friends, but the friend of the random person has mu plus the variance over mu friends. And in fact, the greater the dispersion, the greater the degree heterogeneity in the network, the more this thing will work. And if, in the limiting case, in the other situation, if we all had the same number of friends, then this wouldn't work at all. It's because we vary in the number of friends we have that when you pick a random person and they nominate their friend, that person will have more friends than they do. Or to describe it one last way, imagine you have a cocktail party hostess who's hosting a party and she invites 100 people to her party and they don't know anyone but her. And now you go and you sample from this, this population. Everyone in this party, when asked to nominate who their friend is, will nominate the cocktail party hostess who has 100 friends and each of them and, and, and that's it. They have, that person has more friends than they do. And it's only when, by dumb luck, you pick the cocktail party hostess that she can only nominate someone who has fewer friends than she do. There's a very heterogeneous distribution in that situation. So if we can use this technique, this friendship paradox technique, you see, then, to find who central individuals are without mapping the network. We can sample in a population, have them nominate their friends, and then track the friends, and ideally also track the random people, and then exploit this information to develop a forecasting tool in circumstances in which we actually cannot see the whole network, although there are other online circumstances in which we obviously can. So we tested this idea using an outbreak of H1N1 flu in Harvard students from September to December two years ago in 2009. And we measured flu in two different ways. One was by diagnoses made by physicians at the University Health Services, and this was tracked daily using passive data. The important point here is once we got the students to identify themselves and their friends, they needed to do nothing else. That was it. Then we just got the data passively from an archive of data that was already being collected when they presented for healthcare use at the University Health Services. In addition, and separately, in this particular application, we also emailed the students twice a week and had them report to us whether or not they had flu symptoms, and we used a validated measure of uh, influenza-like illness uh, in this population, uh, and we tracked it in ways I won't go into. And so once again, to remind everybody, what we would have predicted, uh, we're going to draw 1,300 Harvard undergrads. We took a random sample of 13 Harvard 
1,300 Harvard undergraduate students. We asked them to nominate their friends, and we followed all these people, both the randoms and the friends, for flu symptoms on a daily basis. And ultimately, we tracked the flu symptoms of 744 students embedded in a network of nearly 1,800 people, which is a very large fraction of the Harvard undergraduate populations. And here again are the theoretical predictions. We predict that the random students would have this epidemic growth curve in red, and that the friends of the random students would have this epidemic growth curve on the yellow, cumulative on the left, and daily incidence on the right. And here, in fact, is the data from the study almost exactly matching the prediction. And in fact, the epidemic peaked two weeks earlier in the random, in the friends, than it did in the randoms. So just if I had this piece of information alone, I could have at least two-week advance notice of a flu epidemic striking this population. And actually, you can do even better prospectively, because if you are monitoring both the randoms and the friends, and you're just sitting there as the analyst, for instance, let's say I went to UHS, the University of Health Services, and I said, Tom, Dick, and Harry are randomly chosen people, and Betty, Sue, and Jane are the friends. Now just sit there and watch. Do Betty, Sue, and Jane appear before Tom, Dick, and Harry? And if Betty, Sue, and Jane appear, soon Tom, Dick, and Harry will appear. So you just have to sit there and wait and see if they happen. And do you see a divergence between the Tom, Dick, and Harry group and the Betty, Sue, and Jane group? And if you do, bang, you know the epidemic is coming. And sure enough, that divergence point occurred statistically six weeks before the epidemic uh, spiked in the population in these, uh, at Harvard uh, in this situation. So that's a lot of advanced time about a flu epidemic striking. Most public health professionals will tell you even a month's warning about an epidemic is useful to position people in the right location and do other kinds of interventions. Now, um, in this situation, although it wasn't necessary to map the network, these are the results that get us as far as we needed to go, because it was a, and this same thing could be done with a whole city of people, and we're working on some further projects which we can discuss if you're interested. Although it wasn't necessary to map the network, because it was a confined population, we could also actually map the network. And here's what the network of the student population looked like uh, in this situation. Every dot's a student and every line represents a relationship. And when we went back to this uh, uh, network and we computed for every node the degree, the transitivity, and the centrality like I told you earlier, we could then compare and test whether there was a difference according to your location along those other axes that I told you earlier. So if we picked at the median high versus low in-degree individuals, the high in-degree people got the epidemic 10 days earlier than the low in-degree people. And the low transitivity people got the epidemic 15 days earlier than the high transitivity people. And the high centrality people got the epidemic five days, you know, were infected five days earlier than the low centrality people. So all three of these other properties which are properties you could discern if you had the complete network also stacked up in the ways that we predicted. Moreover, we could actually, in this situation, create, because we had daily information about the flu, could actually create video movies that showed the spread of the epidemic, and such data are very rare. I'm going to show you now a little 30-second video animation clip of real data. Here's the network. The dots are going to light up, so we're going to start on, on September 1st, 2009. We're going to take daily cuts through the network for 120 days. Dot, red dots are going to be cases of the flu, yellow dots are friends of cases of the flu, and dot size represents how many friends of yours are affected, have been infected with the flu germ. And if you look at this uh, epidemic, here we go, we're on the end of September now, you can see kind of a blooming in the middle and a contiguous spread through the network uh, as you monitor this type of a population. You could incidentally do this with Twitter data or other data as well, like tracking flow if you have the actual, not just the feed data, but the connections between people in this kind of way. Now you're reaching the, the plateau phase, and here's the end of the epidemic. Now, how much advance warning might be obtained with this method of monitoring the friends of randomly chosen members of a population will depend on many different things, okay? So this is not, you're not always going to get two or six weeks of advance warning. For Ebola, you might get no warning. You might get an hour's warning. It might be useless, the amount of warning you get, okay? Um, it'll depend. It'll depend on the intrinsic properties of the thing that's spreading. The actual biology of the pathogen or the stickiness of the information uh, might affect how much advance warning you get. It'll depend on how you ascertain um, the infection, like how is it measured. It will depend on the nature of the population, for instance, the prevalence of resistance to the pathogen. It will depend on the actual topology of the network. Remember earlier I told you that if you have a homogeneous network, then this thing might work less well than if you have a heterogeneous degree distribution. And it will also depend on this topic of network deformation. So for instance, if as the pathogen is spreading it kills you, 
it rewires the network as it's moving through uh, the population, and this will affect the ability of this technique to work. Or it, might, um, or it might make people, if you start like breaking out in hives or having some unattractive thing and people no longer interact with you because you're sending that kind of visual signal, uh, then maybe um, the network will change its topology as the pathogen is moving through it. So there are a bunch of complications that will affect how much advance warning you can get. But as I've been already suggesting, this method is not restricted to germs, but will work for anything that spreads in populations by person-to-person -person means, whether it's pathogens, information, norms, or behaviors. And these behaviors could include other health-related phenomena, like attitudes towards vaccination. You're interested in is, why is this population, is this population going to be responsive to my desire to vaccinate them? Uh, vaccination itself, what's the uptake of the vaccine? Smoking behavior, health information, attitudes and knowledge about safe sex, which might spread between people, and so on and so forth. But the key thing is that for this method to be useful, the thing in question must spread interpersonally, at least in part, and not just affect people independently via some kind of broadcast mechanism. So for this example, consider the difference between your behavior when it comes to purchasing electronics, like an iPad, versus something like tires for your car. Do you think that you're more likely to buy an iPad if your friends buy an iPad, people you know? Yes. Do you think you're more likely to buy tires for your car if your friends buy tires for your car? Probably not, okay? So we, even within things like products, whether the technique will work, we have to plausibly believe or know that the behavior of one person will influence the behavior of another person, and not that there's some kind of stimulus to purchase tires that's either constant or has to do with something other than interpersonal influence. There has to be some interpersonal influence for this technique to work. And of course, as I've also been hinting, and as you saw just a moment ago, we can use data from all different sorts now, not just restrict to the friendship nomination technique. Uh, phone companies, email providers, online networks, and other sources are, are available to generate network maps and to track pertinent behaviors and attitudes or even intervene. For instance, this is a, a portion of a data from a real European country, a network of 8 million phone users, and it's not surprising to imagine that you could take such data and identify central and peripheral individuals and then track them. For instance, the phone company knows who's adopting a new product. And the phone company also knows who's central and who's peripheral. So the phone company could, for instance, discern how are my customers, are they adopting the product that I'm offering and I'm advertising, and are they more of them likely to adopt it or not? The key thing, remember, is that you need two pieces of information. You need topological information about the structure of the network, and in addition, you need information about the um, monitoring the individuals for whether they've ex uh, ex expressed the germ, have the germ, or expressed the behavior. The latter can be acquired in a number of ways. It can be acquired passively, like the phone example I just gave, where the phone company both knows whether you've adopted the product and knows the structure. It can be acquired quasi-actively. So in this idea, it would be that, for instance, we go out and we survey the people in Libya, and we ask them, could you nominate a friend, and could the two of you agree that we're just going to monitor you to see whether you show up at a healthcare facility, for example? Uh, so it's a combination of direct contact plus passive monitoring, or it could be active, where given a network, like a network like you describe, you go to the central people and you say, are you willing to just tell me your temperature every day? Just send me a text message with your temperature every day. And as soon as you see a divergence in fever between central and random people in the network, you'll have a clue that some kind of infection is going to strike the population through a combination of crowdsourcing the sensing with passive observation of the topology. So one way or another, you need to get both pieces of information, and you can get them both passively, or one actively, and one passively, or both actively, however you wish. And there are other kinds of ways that this can be applied. This is one of several ways since then we've begun to apply these data. This is a network of physicians. Every dot is a physician. Every line between them represents that the physicians share patients in common. This is generated using Medicare claims data, which is you know, passive data that's already archived. So we see that, oh, John and I share 100 patients in common, you and I share no patients in common, you and I share 10 patients in common, and so forth. We draw ties between us according to whether we have any patients in common, and the strength of the relationship is the number of patients we, we have uh, in common. So you can map this network, and now you can get doctors who are central and peripheral, and you can observe their predilection to prescribe particular kinds of medications. Are they adopting a new drug that's being launched, like Genuvia by Merck, in a particular place at a particular time? 
And so this is an anti-diabetes drug called Genuvia. This is all the doctors in Raleigh-Durham, 610 doctors in Raleigh-Durham in a particular time period. And we were able to discern the fact that the central doctors were more likely to adopt the Genuvia. They clustered in certain ways that are in keeping with other ideas that we have about how networks operate. And in fact, you can begin to see that this doctor here might be acting as a choke point to this peninsula of physicians, none of whom have adopted the innovation yet. But if you could persuade this doctor, let's say, to do that, you might open the floodgates. Or similar kinds of things might happen with vaccination behavior. Maybe these doctors aren't vaccinating their patients for whatever reason, and you could figure out how this is going on. And again, the idea here is that you've used passive data to discern the network and passive data to discern the practice or the uh, uh, behavior of interest. So we can discern networks, and we can use people as sensors in all sorts of ways. We are, in fact, as you all know, in the era of massive passive data collection. And we can harness huge amounts of naturally collected data. New technologies track so much about people, where they are, who they're talking to, what they're buying, and what they are writing. And all of this will allow a whole new way of understanding social systems and social processes and actually intervening in them for the better. Now, it also offers creepy kind of big brother possibilities as well, and we can talk a little bit about the ways that this technology, like any technology, like nuclear power or guns or anything we might invent, could be put to evil purposes and not just good purposes. The availability of all these data about human behavior heralds the onset of a, kind of, a new kind of computational social science, which is what we're all here to discuss. We can link behaviors to connections and understand how exactly the whole comes to be greater than the sum of its parts, and we can use these insights for the better. Thank you. Can we do some questions? Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I was. Do, do people have questions? Have a. Yeah. I tried to be succinct. Uh, yeah. Dr. Christakis, thank you for coming. Um, uh, I'm David Scales. I, I also work for HealthMap, but I'm. Also a medical sociologist, so I'll look forward to talking to you more later. Um, one of the things that you brought up that I thought was really interesting was uh, right at the end you talked about the choke points, um, where a doctor might be acting as a choke point, sort of preventing this kind of epidemic of uh, certain prescription usage or to the other side immune, of the network. Or it could be an immune person, someone immune to a disease, right? So if it's a disease that's flowing, you might see that one village doesn't get infected because their person that goes to market is immune, whereas the other villages, their person that goes to market is susceptible and can bring it back. Go on. Sure. Well, what I'm interested in is, is if you guys have looked into these choke points, because you can imagine for certain behaviors, you, would want, you might want yes. to sway them towards creating more choke points, uh, such as anti-vaccination behaviors. Yes. And others, you might want to, to reduce the choke points, such as people who don't want to vaccinate or something like that. Yes, that's right. I mean, we, we've begun to do, apply some of these ideas in certain ways, but some wonderful modeling work was done by um, Cohen and Revoon, I don't know how to pronounce his name exactly, where they uh, modeled what it would mean to be able to, um, to, if you had a finite amount of vaccine, so all of you probably know this, right? If you have 1,000 people in a population and you vaccinate 960 of them against measles, you don't get measles epidemics because you get herd immunity. The last 40 people you don't have to vaccinate, okay? Now, if you have 300 doses of a vaccine for 1,000 people and you vaccinate them, you still get an epidemic. The 300 are immune, but the rest you can get a measles, will take root, and you'll get an epidemic. What these guys showed is that both for um, real epidemics like measles, but also for uh, um, computer viruses, if you can identify central people and vaccinate them, uh, you can actually prevent epidemics from taking root with astonishing efficiency. So catch this. You take 1,000 people, you pick 300 of them at random, you have them nominate their friends, and you use your scarce 300 doses of vaccine and just vaccinate the friends. And if you do that, it's as effective as vaccinating 960 of the people. It's astonishing. And the reason you can imagine is that it's pointless to vaccinate all these people on the edge, right? They're a waste of vaccine. So if you know who is, who is central, just start vaccinating. In fact, it works all the way through the network. You can get these zones where you can interrupt the flow of the epidemic by doing it. And you can actually do this if you could feel such a cruel thing where you go to someone, you say, who's your friend? Okay, thank you, no vaccine for you. And you go and you vaccinate their friend. But in theory, it works with modeling. And so in the example that you were just asking me, you know, what could you do in this situation? You know, maybe you could begin to apply such things in some particular ways. Or 
I suppose if you had enough, you could vaccinate people. Let's say you had 600 doses of vaccine. Rather than doing 600 at random, you would pick 300 at random and then the friends of the 300 and vaccinate them, for example. Yeah. Uh, really nice presentation. Uh, uh, I assume it depends on the topology, but if you, uh, instead of doing the friends of the random people, you do the friends of the friends of the random people. Yes. Does that make a difference? Yes, that's a great question. We, we looked at that. It, tur it turns out that the friends of friends, the curve is shifted, as you would predict, up to the left again. So it shifts again, but it's, it's a narrower shift, okay? Partly because when you take a random walk through the network, some steps go back to the original person. So I say, you are my friend, and, the, and you nominate the friend of friend, and then you re I don't. The scientist doesn't tell you who nominated you. It comes to you and say, who's your friend? You nominate me back, so it comes back to me. I'm a random. I'm not a further more central in the network. You sort of see what I mean? Yeah, but your prediction is absolutely right. The curve is shifted. And in the flu thing, we didn't publish the data, or if we did, it's in the supplement. You get another extra day or so by getting friends of friends. But it's really difficult in a practical matter to get friends of friends. Now, if you have the whole topology, you actually can just find the central people. There's some other wrinkles which I didn't go into. Um, let me see if I have a slide that I can illustrate that point. Um, it turns out that if you have the whole network, you don't actually want to pick the six most central people because they're all connected to each other. So there's like a kind of redundancy there. There's an information optimality that you can achieve by strategically picking a kind of strings on a pearl, pearls on a string strategy, like every other central person, for instance, would be the optimal choice of sensors. And other computer scientists since then have begun to think about these kinds of optimal strategies. You might, if you have the whole network, who would you actually pick? You wouldn't just rank people from most to least central and pick the top 10. There'd be a more shrewder way you could go about picking them. Yeah. Now, I have a question. This one won't be related with humans, but I have, if this network uh, that you're using can be used like in, in animals. Like yes. If you have a group like of primates that you have, you know the behavior. Yes. And you know very good how it works, if you can use this. Yes. Type. Yes, it can. And we were talking to um, Nathan Wolf at the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative about the possibility of trying to identify, you know, central primates, you know, when they have game that's brought in. Is there some way to know, you know, attributes of the creature that would somehow tell you when if this one's infected, it means something different than if a random draw is infected. And of course, in, in zoo populations and other kinds of situations like that, yes, it should work. But the key thing is there has to be some kind of interpersonal spread, and you have to be able to plausibly discern relevant ties. Keep in mind that if we're looking at something like syphilis, syphilis doesn't spread in casual contact. So identifying who's whose business partner, for instance, or who's whose friend, well, you wouldn't want the syphilis network to overlay the business network. Uh, but, <laughs> but, I mean, you, you want, there has to be a tie that's relevant to the thing that is spreading, you know. Um, and, and so you would have to find the analogous thing, uh, you know, with animals. Like, what counts as a tie? And is this the kind of tie through which the pathogen might spread from one animal to another? But if so, yes, absolutely, it'll work. Okay. It should Thank work. You. Thank you very much. Yeah. I actually had one last question, which was, you know, a lot of us in the room are thinking about online social networks, yes. Twitter, Facebook. The topology of those networks, how much do those translate to real world networks? I mean, okay, so there's, yeah, that's a good question. So there are two ways I can answer that question. First, I can say that if you're able to drill down, we have a whole set of work on this, which I didn't present today. If you're able to find who among the Facebook and Twitter and other networks is a real social connection, and you map those networks, their topology is basically isomorphic with face-to-face -face networks. So, for example, if I, look at your your, if I look at your phone records and map a phone, like this phone database, you know, looks like, you know, just crudely, uh, looks like, you know, a, a human network, right? It, roughly speaking, it doesn't look very different. Buried in all these ties are real connections, and if I removed all the weak connections and just left the real ones, in fact, it would come to look just like the other networks that I showed you earlier. So the first answer to your question is, insofar as you're able to identify using machine learning things like reciprocation of tweets, retweeting, duration of following, the speed with which I retweet your information versus her information, you're a good friend of mine, I follow what you're doing, I don't pay so much attention to her. So you can infer certain properties, okay, you could do that. So the first answer to your question is to the extent that buried within them are real networks, then you can exploit it. But second, actually, Online networks, their mathematical structure is very similar, if not identical, to the face-to-face -face networks anyway. So the same kind of thing that I've discussed with you today would and should also work with those things. We've made some applications of this idea. We've shown that um, using um, 
in, uh, in face, it use a Facebook network, uh, the, um, let's see how to put this exactly, the uh, display of certain properties within this network, when one person displays it, uh, it affects others. Again, as predicted, the central people, you get bigger epidemics. Thank you very much.